Welcome everyone uh, to our Vertex uh, webinar series. So today's uh, topic is uh, digital marketing. We have an uh, exciting list of speakers and topics uh, planned ahead. Um, first, uh, let's um, uh, do some uh, quick uh, housekeeping and basics. Um, so please note the session is recorded and you can submit questions via the, uh, uh, the Q&A button uh, at the bottom. Um, um, the quick introduction to our panel today. So our first speaker is Jenny, who has a very interesting background with uh, over 10 years of investment banking, venture capital um, list uh, experience before joining the digital marketing side. He's, she's currently the head of uh, client, uh, client solution management at Facebook Singapore. She helps uh, some of the region's most uh, influential uh, corporate and startups to build their business and marketing strategy. Jenny will share some of the most uh, common questions and, and the solutions around the Facebook marketing later. So today I will be the moderator. John the Vortex 10 years ago has uh, covered the various industries from uh, deep tech e-commerce to fintech. So welcome to reach out if you are at the right from the recent stage. Um, our first panelist is Drew, who, um, who is uh, uh, currently the director of digital natives and the technology with Facebook and manage uh, Facebook's uh, relationship with some of the largest uh, tech players in this region. So before Facebook, uh, she was, uh, he was with uh, Google for almost uh, 10 years. So has covered uh, two of the biggest uh, digital marketing ecosystem. Uh, he's also currently a part of Android investor network uh, called Lugler, formed by ex Googler. So feel free to reach out to him if you are look uh, looking for uh, Android funding. So our uh, next uh, panelist is Magna, uh, Chief Business Officer at Licious. Licious is currently the leading fresh meat e-commerce platform in India. Um, a seasoned professional with almost uh, 20 years of experience, Magna Bruins uh, with, uh, with her rich experience of working with some of the largest names in India, including Amazon, uh, Amazon and Unilever Extra. So our last panelist is Yuri, uh, who leads uh, Asia Parents effort to develop new disruptive ways to engage audience. His many new initiatives uh, there include uh, its um, uh, D2C brand, Mama's Choice, and its new nano influencer platform, TAP Fluencer. Um, interestingly, Yuri also has um, um, an investment banking consulting background before joining the startup world by holding various uh, positions and uh, la la la. So um, let's uh, start our session today, growing your company with uh, digital marketing. So, um, First, um, here's a poll for uh, our audience uh, so we can get a sense like which stage um, is everyone and building their digital marketing strategy. Uh, Um, then uh, let's look at some uh, statistics, uh, statistics first. Um, as we can see, digital marketing increasingly dominate the ad spending globally. Uh, it leads the uh, ad spending with over 50% in the US and the even more with uh, over 70% in China. So we may expect South East Asia and India will resemble the growth of China in the uh, coming years rather than US. Um, Talking about the digital marketing, many entrepreneurs uh, may think of digital marketing as art, art of selling, right? Uh, and we'll talk about advertisements uh, as creative and always eager to start selling immediately. However, digital marketing is probably more sense than art. So digital marketing has a very systematic way of uh, analyzing and influencing customers towards a buying decision. So simply put, it's a system to understand your typical customer profile and the decision journey um, and design various marketing messages along their journey to help them achieve the uh, buying decision. 
So one major difference uh, compared to the traditional uh, marketing landscape is that uh, the amount of data we can leverage for analytics uh, and the optimization of uh, each uh, 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 stage. So uh, this uh, come to my last uh, slides, uh, which basically captures the uh, past, present, and future of digital marketing. And you can see that we have come a long way. In the beginning, it was uh, mainly static uh, content. And now this is uh, social driven with uh, rich media and largely performance based. There are many potential development in the future, but uh, personalization and the interactivity is certainly among them. So whatever it becomes, it will certainly be more engaging. So now let's review the result from the first poll. So yeah, I, I can say it's uh, spread evenly, kind of evenly among the uh, top three. Uh, many has uh, 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 more than half already started, but uh, still trying to achieve the optimization stage. Uh, then 26% not started yet, but I guess um, um, many are still in the stage of starting the company or maybe launching the product. Um, so next, um, let's welcome our first speaker, Jenny to share uh, some of the most common questions and um, solutions around Facebook marketing for startup and entre entrepreneurs. Thank Jenny, you. Just, over um, you. Share my screen. Um, are you guys able to see, see my screen? All good? Yep. Cool. Um, hi everyone, I'm Jenny. I head the client solutions management team for Facebook in Singapore. I think one of the greatest joys of my job is actually getting to work with startups and entrepreneurs in the region um, to really help drive their business forward. So we strategize together, we experiment together on you know how to best leverage Facebook and our family of apps. So today um, I, I thought a lot about what I can present in 15 minutes given that it's a relatively short period of time but I think based on the survey results I'm actually quite happy that we have a good kind of range of audiences of people who are starting to, to get a little bit accustomed to digital marketing as well as those who are optimizing and scaling so it is a pretty good mix of folks um, so today I'm, I just wanted to share you know some of the key learnings when it comes to how to really maximize Facebook marketing and um, again I'm going to assume that a lot of the audiences uh, kind of in the optimization um, stage of and have some level of digital marketing. So let's actually start with the problem statement. So here are the top five most common questions I actually hear from founders and marketers who are actively using our platform. So the first one is that performance on the platform is quite unstable. Like some days it works, some days it doesn't, not really sure what's going on there. I think the other one is that, you know, the cost per action initially looks pretty good, but over time, as you scale, it becomes very difficult to kind of sustain that level of performance and they're not really sure what they're doing wrong. Um, the other one is that like, you know, there's, they're not exactly sure what works, what strategy works, what doesn't work and feel a bit flying in the blind. And then the other one is, you know, around creative. So is my ad creative good enough? Um, are creatives even important at all when it comes to social platforms and how should I make my investment in creatives? And then lastly, um, it's around, you know, how do I think about marketing measurement as my company evolves? What are some of the KPIs that I should be looking at uh, right now and how should that be changing over time? So I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes just kind of double clicking into each of these topics and just summarizing some of the core learnings that you need to know when it comes to answering the, these questions. So a couple of things, success in digital marketing really boils down to how well you can maximize machine learning that the platform offers. So you need to assess the, you also need to assess the health of your marketing funnel and start mapping out the user journey um, from the moment that they see the ad all the way to when they want, you want them to take the action. And I think another thing is, you know, all startups obviously kind of live and die by experimentation and A-B testing, um, but you want to make sure that you have very clear protocols on how you do that in a very clear sort of testing agenda. When it comes to creatives, there's a bit of a uniqueness on social platforms that you want to be aware of when you're developing your creative strategy. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about LTV measurement and um, I'll introduce you to our analytics tool for analytics tools for you to try out.
So if you've ever run Facebook ads, um, you would have seen this type of notification on ads manager that says, you know, learning phase in progress. So what this essentially means is that the system is still trying to collect enough, enough signals to better predict who to show your ads to. So our system needs at least 50 conversion events at an ad set level, and this is not at a campaign level. This is where I see a lot of startups make mistakes. It's not at a campaign level, but at an ad set level. So to fully get out of learning phase, you need to have that minimum number of conversions. And actually, the longer it takes for you to get out of the learning phase, the more volatile your marketing results are actually going to be. Because what that means is that the algorithm is just not at a stable state yet to predict. So as you can see here, um, there's almost a bit of a direct correlation between the percentage of time that your ad sets are actually spent in learning phase, as well as your average CPAs. So the longer you stay in learning phase, basically the higher your CPAs are going to be. And that really is the core of what's driving the volatile performance. So then you probably have the question around, so then what is, like, how do I get out of learning phase? What are some of the common mistakes um, when it comes to learning phase? And how do I get out of that learning phase sooner? So there are a couple of components of it. It generally boils down to a couple of reasons that I've kind of laid out here. So targeting and your audience is, is very important. Often the mistake that I see a lot of startups make is that your audience is either way too narrow um, or you have multiple ad sets that are kind of competing against the same audience or they're generally a bit of similar kind of interest targeting that go against each other. So the problem of, with having a lot of ad sets is as I mentioned, the more ad sets you have, the more pressure you're actually putting on the system to find that minimum number of conversions. So having a really clean structure in your campaign is actually really the essence as a startup. When you start out your marketing journey, you wanna make sure that you have a very mutually exclusive um, campaign structure that is very, very clean. So keep that in mind um, when you think about targeting and also placement is very similar as well. I know a lot of startups who tend to run separate campaigns for Facebook, separate campaigns for Instagram. That can be good for experiment or kind of an exploration stage, but um, again, kind of similar to targeting, the more you split out the ad sets at an ad set level, the worse your performance is going to be. So similar to targeting, similar to placement, um, make sure that you're consolidating your ad sets. Keep as much of a clean structure as possible. The other thing is around budget and bidding. Um, so you want to revisit your budget and bid bid to see if you're becoming a little bit too restrictive. So when you're initially running your Facebook marketing campaigns, I think a lot of people opt in for auto bid. So try not to experiment on manual bid unless you have a pretty good sense of um, what your CPA is, what does your user LTV look like? And that's gonna require running a couple of experiments before you get into manual bid. So definitely try out auto bid. And once you get a better understanding of what your CPA is, um, you want to start calibrating your bid a little bit. So only then do you want to actually move into manual bid. And then um, you always want to kind of figure out the dynamics between budget and bidding to see if you're being way too restrictive. Um, lastly, a bit of a quick hack. So if you don't see enough, let, let's say you tried all of these things and you still don't see enough events. A very kind of easy way to do this is just to go a little bit upper funnel. So I see a lot of startups who do lead generations and then oftentimes, um, depending on your platform, depending on the service that you offer, you just may not be seeing enough leads. So you may not be getting to that 50 conversion events. And a, a real easy hack is just to, opt, instead of optimizing towards leads, go a little bit higher um, in the funnel and start optimizing towards landing pages, for example, until you get those minimum number of signals. And the really important thing actually is that, um, you know, when you change any of these five things that I've mentioned, the learning phase starts all over again. So try not to make frequent changes. And again, this is a very common mistake I see from a lot of startups where you change your ad sets way too frequently, because I think you're on, you know, if something doesn't work, you feel like you need to change that. If something does work, you want to scale that and you start changing the budgets. The moment you start playing with some of these variables, the learning phase journey starts all over again. So just be careful in terms of how frequently you're actually making changes um, to your advertising. So I talked a lot about, you know, what not to do. So um, when it comes to, you know, what do I actually have to do? So I wanted to introduce you guys to a bit of um, a variety of products that allow you to kind of maximize machine learning. So there are a lot more in the Facebook ecosystem, but I just thought I'd bring up three things really quickly. 
Um, so campaign budget optimization, this basically auto allocates budgets across ad sets. So instead of you having to allocate budgets across ad sets, depending on the performance, you just basically set a budget at a campaign level and then let the machine learning take care of the allocation. So that's a, a, a good kind of product to try out. I think the other one is dynamic language optimization, which is actually great if you are a startup that has customers in more than one geography that speak different languages. So it'll automatically show ads in the user's language setting without you having to interfere to that. And then there's also dynamic creative optimization where our system basically creates a permutation of images, texts, and call to actions, and it runs these various combinations to different users to really maximize results. So the essence and the beauty of all of this stuff is that, you know, there's no manual intervention. It's all based on machine learning. It's all automated. So try out some of these thick features if you think it makes sense for your business. And, and this is a great way to kind of maximize the signals that you're getting. So the other one is around, you know, my cost per action continues to increase on Facebook. So when it comes to digital marketing, it's somewhat of an expected outcome to some degree because you're going to be exhausting some of the immediate opportunities and then you need to make your marketing dollars work a little bit harder once that's dried up. But one of the common things that I do observe from startups trying to scale is that, you know, even when you're considering that kind of expected norm, things go a little bit out of whack once they start scaling. And this generally happens when your marketing funnel starts breaking down. So when you start scaling your company, you would generally start with, you know, some form of a direct response campaign that, you know, it will get people to download an app, um, sign up a lead form or purchase on your website. And it's going to work very well initially, um, but you'll start drying up the pool and we'll start running out of those low hanging fruits which means that then you need to start investing in building a bit of a story and awareness um, around what you're offering and you know, get, them, get your users to take even a slightest action like landing on your website so that you can actually build a really rich pool of retargeting audiences. So after you start that experiment, then you can actually start running some really interesting experiments on what's the right investment mix around the funnel. So for example, acquisition versus retargeting. For your business, is the right optimal mix 70-30 or is it 50-50? And these are things that you can actually start experimenting on the platform. And once you find that right optimal funnel mix, um, your total user acquisition cost is going to show more stability. So the biggest mistake that I see from startups and, and, and people working in marketing departments in these startups is just not knowing when to start broadening their funnel and you know, not running enough experiments on figuring out what is the right marketing funnel mix for you. And thinking about the funnel from a user experience ex ex perspective is also quite important. So whatever experience you design for your customer from basically when they see the ad all the way up to when they take the action has to be completely frictionless. So you don't want to just be thinking about the ad, but also that post kind of conversion user experience as well. So just taking an example of a messenger bot for an e-commerce store, for example, you basically see an ad. And then when you design what that bot should look like, you want to make sure that the landing page is um, somewhat a, a continuation of the ad that you just saw instead of something random. And then obviously you want to keep the conversation pretty light. Um, and then definitely you do want to close it out with a very clear next step and leaving room to kind of always continue back on that dialogue. So opening up that retargeting possibility as well. So that's what I mean by kind of, you know, designing a very frictionless experience um, from when somebody sees the ad all the way up to when that conversion happens. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about experimentation. Um, this really is the key to kind of defining your marketing strategy. But again, as I mentioned, you know, you have to do this the right way. So I can't emphasize enough the fundamentals of marketing experimentation because this is something that even some of our largest clients and, and some of the more sophisticated partners actually still get wrong from time to time. So wanted to walk you guys through a full checklist of, of kind of how you want to do this, right? So you need to test long enough to get statistically significant results. And I've seen um, a lot of startups switch off tests after two days because it doesn't work. Or sometimes I've also seen tests where, you know, in week one, it was a very different result. And in week two, it also showed a very different result. So you want to have a little bit of time to figure out what actually works for your business. So have a bit of patience um, and only call the test to an end when you have a statistically significant conclusion to it. 
Um, the other thing is that it's, it's, it's a little bit, you know, uh, obvious, but, but a good reminder, every other variable except for the one being tested has to be constant. So just make sure you're triple checking on that because also ads manager being somewhat complicated, there are a lot of different components that you can get wrong. So double check on the, the variable that you're testing and whether everything else um, aside from that is very constant. You want to test one thing at a time instead of ambitiously trying to test multiple variables in one go um, because then you wouldn't actually know which variables are driving the results. This one's also really important. Test results are only valid if your campaigns are actually set up right. So if your campaigns were, let's say, constantly in learning phase, as I um, described earlier, or let's say they're under delivering, the results of that test is not going to be reliable. Um, and lastly, you want to spend as much time on analyzing the test as you did on planning it. So um, you can find really interesting learnings, even from tests that kind of failed or tests that you know didn't go as you expected. So for example, if Looking at a CPA metric, cell A might have done slightly better, but looking on a ROAS metric, the other cell B might have done better. So it gives you a little bit of clues about your business and your users. So make sure you're spending enough time on analyzing the, the, the test results um, not, and not just spending time on planning it. So what can you test? You can actually test pretty much anything on the platform. Um, you can run really simple A-B tests that kind of compare you know, targeting options, creative options, bidding options. Um, you can also run some advanced tests that actually test certain strategies against each other. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, what is the optimal marketing funnel mix, for example? Is it better to optimize for multiple events or would you rather do a single event? Um, so these are kind of the big strategic items that you can also experiment as well. Um, so around creative, how important is creative and what should you be aiming for? So close to 60% of the brand sales are actually from digital advertising can actually be attributed to really good creative. So there are a couple of tips that I'd love to leave here. So the first one is using a mix of static and video works much better than using just static or also even just video. And also if you're using video, you know, what you offer, your solution that you have or the brand, you want to make sure that it shows up in the first three seconds of the video, given how users tend to scroll down the feed pretty quickly. Also getting straight to the value proposition of what you offer is, is incredibly important. So even for our largest clients, sometimes what works best is not like visually fancy creative, but it's really just like a dollar sign and a giant discount sign. That sometimes works much better than really, really like visually appealing creative. So you just need to figure out what works for your business. And speaking of video, you don't actually have to produce high quality videos. There's actually a lot of apps and solutions out there currently that help you create video just based on static images. So this is actually one of my favorite local examples that we did a couple of years ago um, with Carousel. So they came to us with a problem statement that you know there are a lot of, they, they have a lot of static images, they run a lot of these things, but they don't want to produce high quality um, videos. They just don't have production budget for it or they don't have resources to do that. So basically we took um, static images and we created about four different versions of short videos that either showed their brand, showed the benefit, or showed the demo of the app. So we were able to run some A-B tests around, you know, which of these value propositions were best. And, and just by doing this, they were able to get significant list of their downloads as well as transactions. So don't feel like you need to invest a ton in producing very high quality video content. You can still do this, do this with the static catalog that you do have. So it's important to understand the unique characteristics of the platform. So I'll give you an example specifically on Instagram stories. And on stories, we are seeing a lot of um, kind of creative hacks from different advertisers. So for example, like using the progression bar to tell a really visually interesting story, that's a bit of a hack. Or you could also be using that kind of 15 second um, limitation of, of the video in Instagram stories to throw a bit of a pop quiz as well. or um, using the hold feature to bring in some excitement to the ad. So we see a lot of kind of different approaches from advertisers on how they want to, how they understand the, the creative platform specific to Instagram stories. Um, and they're doing a lot of efforts and initiatives around it. So lastly, let's talk a little bit about um, marketing measurement. 
So as your company evolves, your business goals are also going to evolve and your marketing KPIs will also evolve. So initially you'll be interested in new user acquisition. Then you'll move into getting into repeat purchases. And then ultimately you will want to build loyalty and LTV. So every stage you'll be asking a set of kind of different questions when it comes to your marketing efforts. Um, and this is an interesting theme that we see from a lot of our uh, advertisers of, you know, shifting from a metric like CPI or CPA more towards optimizing towards lifetime value and loyalty, for example. And it's not an easy journey to make that transition because um, you need a lot of analytical power to understand your user journey. And you are also going to be able to quantify that to really move into a loyalty based um, KPI. So I want to introduce you to a quick tool um, that's, that's a bit under the radar, but it is incredibly powerful. So it's called Facebook Analytics and any business that has a pixel or an SDK installed has free access to this tool. So it'll show you a lot of data cuts on how your users are interacting with your business and you can also customize the various cuts that you want. Um, for example, you can look into demographic details of your audience. You can analyze which cohorts are showing better engagement. Um, you can also actually build a funnel um, based, based on the events uh, to see where your users are dropping off, um, what are some of your potential friction points. And if you actually identify a audience opportunity based on these analyses, you can actually even create an ad targeting immediately from there without actually having to go into ads manager and doing that all over again. And you can have various segment cuts of all of this data, which is what makes this tool pretty powerful. Um, so just wanted to leave everyone with that and you should try it out if you haven't already. So just recapping and revisiting all of these, um, let the machine learning do its job. If you have to remember one thing on this, the more granular you start breaking out your campaign structure and the more complicated it becomes, the worse your results are going to be. The other one is just making sure that you're building a marketing funnel, know when to move out and expand into broader targeting um, and know when to experiment on um, the different types of marketing funnel mixes. And then also remember the best practices around experimentation um, and understanding the platform really well. Some of the creative examples that I showed you today uh, around building the right creative strategy and really understanding the platform to kind of do that. I think that's, a, that's an important point. And then lastly, building your analytical muscles um, for better marketing measurement um, is the last point that I'd love to leave you with. So thank you so much for your time today. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Jenny. Thanks a lot for the insightful sharing. Um, I think the most important quote I remember is that um, leave uh, to machine learning to do the job. So if you have any questions, uh, welcome to reach out to Jenny. Uh, uh, any, like, um, if your company has any digital marketing need, to reach out to her. So next, uh, let's uh, get uh, our panel ready. Uh, at the same time, you will find another poll. Um, as we saw that just now, digital marketing is not an easy task. So uh, the question is, do you, uh, do you use a digital marketing consultant, outsource everything, or shall try to build the expertise uh, internally? Thanks. Yeah, so yeah, our panel is here. You can unmute the, now, yeah. So the first question to everyone is that uh, uh, Jenny just shared actually quite a few um, com uh, common uh, questions uh, for the Facebook um, ecosystem. But from your personal experience, what's the biggest uh, mistake of uh, misperception startup usually has about uh, digital marketing. Maybe we can start from Yuri. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest mistake I've seen startups and, and also bigger company going much more digital is focusing on the lower funnel completely as uh, going straight for, Oh, what's my, my ROI. And, and, and then you just start targeting the same people again and again because the algorithm will go for the people that are the most, the most uh, likely to convert. And as Jenny said, after a while, your funnel doesn't have new people that are coming in anymore and you're just increasing frequency on the same people and you will see your costs going, going up. And I've experienced that in Lazada where we did it on a very big scale. I've experienced it with my little brand Mama's Choice now. Um, I think it's a very common thing. And there's many case studies for Nike, Adidas, 
and other big brands who have done exactly the same and it's always the same mistake. So uh, others, uh, feel free to jump in if uh, you have any comments. Uh, maybe Matt now, Chuf. One of the things that I'd like to add is uh, the part about let the machine do its, uh, its job. I think that's uh, quite powerful in the context of constantly testing and learning. Because we go in with a certain bunch of hypotheses, I think it's really important to watch how your campaigns perform and make those adjustments. But at the same time, the other thing that Jenny said was equally important that sometimes we judge too quickly. So you know what, I spent X dollars already and I don't see a return and you may make a wrong decision. So I think it's very important to understand how to test the time frames of testing, et cetera, so that you interpret the information very accurately. So I don't, it's, uh, it sounds very data oriented and hence quite scientific, but what I've seen is it's also a huge layer of art as you try and, uh, and figure this out. So I think it's important to carve out uh, time, effort and money to be able to test accurately uh, you, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Yeah, well, I don't have much, uh, much more to add, except that I can give you some context on why this is counterintuitive. So 10 years back, when I started my job in digital marketing, the proposition that digital marketing companies had was, look, we are very targeted. You do TV, print, radio, and you don't know how to target with that. So here are all the options that you have to build campaigns that are highly targeted. And now 10 years since, what's happened is that the key thing that all companies, Facebook, Google, are working on is on how to automate and use machine learning to minimize intervention. So as a startup, you might feel, look, why do we have so many controls if, if you're actually coming and telling us that please depend on automation? It's just the evolution of digital marketing over the last 10 years. So the biggest mistake is if you do digital marketing like people did 10 years back, which is get super targeted, either, uh, you know, what Yuri said, focusing just on the lower funnel or what Meghna said, not depend on machine, then you're actually doing stuff that people were doing 10 years back. Now it's more about machine learning and automation. I guess also because uh, digital market, digital ecosystem evolve become like more we, comes with more granular data and uh, op steps for you to optimize. So now now that uh, maybe like human cannot really control the whole process already. But I'm wondering like um, um, what uh, how much machine can do in the long run? Are we taking like eighty uh, percent or like twenty percent? Uh, because as a, for the for the marketing or advertising industry, there's a, always a largely a creative component, right? See what I'd, I'd like to chime in on that. I think it's always going to be an art and a science. So the machine is going to learn many, many more new things and can become much more automated. But that's where we as people and as uh, you know, bright uh, digital marketers will step in. And I will use a basic example. Yeah. So for example, with uh, we have seen in this kind of lockdown uh, uh, life, a lot of recipes are were trending. Yeah. If you're looking for recipes, and as a meat brand that we uh, 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 with Licious in India, it's a it was a great opportunity, but we didn't see as much bang for the buck as we assumed. When we went a little uh, little deeper, and you'll probably laugh when you hear this. A whole lot of recipes are vegetarian recipes and there is a vegetarian community. Now, if I target a meat advertising to a vegetarian person, it is not going to give me any return. So if I stop at the level of just the recipe, I now need to learn and look at the next set of keywords and going deeper to show the recipes only to the meat eaters. And that explodes my campaign to make it work effectively. So I think it's layering of this sort of nature, which becomes important, which over time you will teach the machine, but I think we will constantly keep moving the bar in terms of that customization. Yeah. Actually, I think Magna touched a very interesting question around the, the customer profile. Um, among the, for the, to build a digital marketing funnel entry and the top, um, you really need to understand the kind of customer profile. Uh, given the sophistication in India and uh, in Southeast Asia, all the different races, different languages, maybe can you share a bit uh, about um, how w some interesting stories and how challenges you had 
when you trying to understand the, your customer profile in, in your market? Maybe we can start with uh, Magna. Sure. So I think the, in India, it's exceptionally complex because we have uh, many, many more ethnicities and many, many more uh, languages. Different platforms have different level of targeting capabilities based on uh, definitely language choices. I think it's very important to stay on top of those and leverage them. Uh, I still feel that they are a bit under leveraged and we go for more uh, standard languages and going vernacular or local language is, uh, is very, very useful. But also as you do this, you start relegating to the machine much more. So things like dynamic creative optimization become very, very important because it's, it's uh, humanly impossible to do this, uh, uh, do this on your own. So yes, very important and, uh, and, and, and very relevant. Uh, Dury and uh, Juv, anything to add? I think from my side, I mean, and it goes back a bit to the topic before, right? I do believe sometimes there is also value knowing exactly who your customers are, then targeting them specifically, which we do a lot. We're actually going very, very granular. And, and we do a lot of market research to identify who we think are our customers. And then we go after them. And then we take, we use the machine learning to build lookalike audiences of the people in that audience that end up buying. So I would tar target in Jakarta ladies from 25 to 35 that are interested in breastfeeding um, very specifically. Uh, that would be quite ha expensive, but then, and the, because the audience is narrow, but, but once I still see a better pro conversion than on a very general audience, but once I have some conversions on that happening, I can then take those audiences and lo generate lookalikes of them, right? Where the machine then helps me finding similar people to those. And then the audience gets big enough to have a very good performance. So, so, so I think, you don't really go, we never go there and say, oh, target all Indonesians from 18 to 50, right? We, we have an idea who our people are. We go after them and then we build lookalikes based on the ones that worked out. Well, I can share another kind of example on uh, audiences. Of course, the first step as, as both Yuri and Digna mentioned is to know your customers, you know exactly who, who you want to talk to. But there are enough examples of people using uh, Facebook or, or, or other internet platforms to figure out who the audience is. For example, there's a, a recent startup we work with who, who does coding classes online in, uh, in, the, in the pandemic. And their target audience was undergrad students. And what they found on our platform was that people who were actually purchasing most of their products were young parents or middle-aged parents for their teenage children. So they had to very quickly realize that even though they built the product for undergrads in, in their advertising strategy on our platforms, parents were looking to do this for their children who were now learning from home. So the first step has to be get to know who your customers are, like market research, like Yuri said, and like Digna mentioned, like full research goes into who these people are. And then also leverage platforms that are available uh, to fine tune that audience. You might be pleasantly surprised how many other people also like your product? Yeah, actually, that's a very interesting uh, observation. I, I would say that um, traditionally, the digital market, the, the traditional marketing landscape is that you do a lot of heavy survey, try to understand um, your customers, then implement a big, um, a big band type of marketing so that you can try to reach out, convert them. But in the digital marketing or digital area, Nowadays, uh, we startups, uh, entrepreneurs have the luxury that um, they design a product, launch online, but uh, when immediately, probably they either uncover some new market segment, a new customer profile, then they quickly go back and change the product so that uh, the, the product design and the marketing and the, like customer research and uh, uh, ma marketing final building conversion all come together and uh, it's constantly changing rather than like, it's uh, designed uh, in one go and uh, like try to run, uh, run it with million dollars, right? Absolutely. Okay. You know, a few years ago, people used to try this with creatives. So, uh, you know, a new phone would, would just be, uh, if you're launching a new phone, uh, they would basically try six different creatives and try to figure out 
which creative works the best or which ad copy works the best and that would also then go on tv you can actually extend that argument to even your uh, certain nuances in the product or your customer segment yeah actually we just invest the um d2c uh, e-commerce uh, brand that uh, the 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 have the develop very basic um, product uh, uh, physical product for overseas for cross border delivery in the beginning then they quickly launch uh, facebook marketing and to test uh, the the willingness to buy then they go back and uh, then iterate on the product itself and before after a few iterations they do a big launch maybe maybe we can show the next uh, poll uh, the the poll result so uh, because um we as we saw that um digital marketing entry is not a quite straightforward uh, um uh, uh, then it's quite specialized so it seems like um there's a large uh, wow, 45% everything is internal uh then there are some people use various diverse uh, external consultant maybe that yeah that that's uh, uh that's uh, probably um um like uh, the uh, what we see in many startups because uh, startups uh, only entry startup knows um, knows the product uh, the marketing message uh, especially given the small size but in term of come to execution um then as we should uh, discuss uh, just now we, when you uh, after you understand the customer profile then actually when you try to build a funnel the first step is um, how to build a large uh, customer funnel to avoid the situation later that um, the cpa once you skill up uh, the cpa will ramp up uh, quickly um, because of many entrepreneurs probably start selling getting into selling mode first so the question is uh, to build uh, a larger um like uh, funnel on, on the top do you have any suggestions or do you have any uh, experience to share i mean uh, i i can start on that one uh, so i think from our side our business that our our mother company is a content company and and content marketing definitely helps a lot right if you create a lot of content that is helpful for your target audience and then you introduce your product within that content right uh, so for us it's a lot about uh, the the journey a mother goes through uh, through her pregnancy and then her early early childhood we have a lot of content around that where we then in somewhere in the content introduce our products which solve certain problems you might face uh, during that time and and i think that's a great way to because getting people to view an article or view an infographic is is extremely cheap on facebook compared to getting somebody to buy right so you can cast out the really wide wide net with your content and and see who might be interested and then and then introduce them to your funnel right and i think creating your own content if the content is good eg people find it interesting facebook will make it really cheap for you to share it right if you even get a lot of uh, a lot of free reach right by just putting it on your channels if your content is very much hey buy this buy this and people don't find it interesting and facebook will make you pay to to show that to a lot of people right so so i i think i think that's 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 my view i just add two things to this i think one is as a startup it's good to define how wide you want to go based on the conversion metrics that you have let's say you want to sell only 100 units of a product and you have 1% conversion you only need to reach uh, say whatever 10000 people yeah so i think it's good to start thinking like that versus go too wide and become kind of over ambitious and burn your dollars so i think it's good to put those metrics down uh, on on one hand from a very you know business sense the second thing which i feel is um, uh everyone talks about it but i still think it's it's very very important in addition to uh, to content to be talking about is seo i think it's the really basic fundamental and i'm quite surprised to see how little everyone does it very effectively very often it's kind of outsourced and you know left there or is the term that is used i think just going into the grind of making sure that absolutely everything you do 
is really, really hardworking. Yeah, because you're anyway doing that piece of work. Yeah, you're writing up a piece of content, you're putting out a post, you're doing all of that. How do you ensure every one of those elements is SEO optimized will give you the right return in the medium to long term? It doesn't show result tomorrow, but it's very, very critical. So I think both these things. So, you know, there's always this tension between narrow and wide and also uh, upper funnel versus lower funnel. And what we are trying to now recommend is thinking about personalized advertising, but at scale. Uh, I think Yuri mentioned this initially on how he uses, uh, how their business uses lookalike audiences. I think once you've got the basic stuff in place, SEO and uh, everything else, if you say extremely, even if you're a B2B SaaS company and you, you know your audiences well, you have the first card and you can build lookalike audiences. The tools that are available now are very powerful and they'll let you know what their other habits and what their other behaviors are. And then you can use those as signals to go up a funnel. Uh, it also depends on the kind of business you have. Sometimes you're in a business where you need to create the market. In that case, upper funnel actually becomes even more important because what we're discovering, especially in Southeast Asia, is often people uh, people have a latent interest to use a service, but they don't actively search for it because they don't know exactly what that service will offer. In that case, using upper funnel marketing based on an initial set of audiences that you have, understanding them more, and then being very data driven about upper funnel marketing so that you don't burn your dollars, uh, as we now put it, is, is very effective. So this notion of personalized at scale is, is, is actually a good balance to think about. Actually, uh, follow up on uh, Magna's uh, comments about SEO. I'm just curious, like, um, uh, Dury, do you or do you still pay a lot of attention to SEO? Oh, absolutely, right. So the Asian parent, our core company, is 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 a publisher, right? And we get sixty, seventy percent of our forty million visits through uh, forty million unique visitors through through SEO, right? So so we're absolutely doubling down on SEO, and yeah, and there's also for me as a brand for for our own products, right? So one thing is building your own SEO, which is very expensive. Uh, and not expensive, time consuming, time consuming. And, and you, even if you do it very good, it will still take time to rank. I mean, there's also shortcuts, right? Some people own some search words and they're not selling a service themselves. So you might be able to convince them to, to feature you either by paying them, ideally not by paying them, but by finding some sort of deal, right? When you're an early stage startup. And I think that's also something that a lot of people don't do enough, right? Figure out what are the keywords that are relevant for you, then see who owns them. Because if you're a very early start, stage startup and you're in a space where the search keywords are already hard, you're not gonna be number one in the next two years, even if you do it really well. So, so then rather figure out who's number one and two and three and four, and is any of them maybe interested in doing a deal with you, right? So Drew, what do you think? Actually, I met the startups uh, nowadays uh, saying they are not patient enough to do SEO. They, uh, well, everything move very fast, right? Just like uh, spam on Facebook. Yeah, I know. Look, so uh, let, me, let me give you the Southeast Asia context, right? At least in some of the uh, e-com e -com players, B2B players and startups. So what's happening, what we are seeing increasingly if that the number of users, digital consumers that are coming online is growing by, you know, 50% year on year, and the amount of money that they want to spend online is also growing. So we expect it to grow by 3.5x by 2025. But 70% of the people who have come online new actually don't know what they want to buy or which service they want to consume. In that scenario, it's not possible for them to search because they don't know what words to type in. So that's the reason why we're seeing in SEA all of you know people kind of move to a discovery-based marketing funnel. People just then go to Facebook, pick the right audience, and then people get influenced. And then once they know that they want to buy that, what we are seeing is they either search in the e-com app, so Lazada's app, or if they're not an e-com player, they will then search on, on a browser. And therefore, all of these angles come together. A few years back is to start with SEO. Uh, in, in, and I'm not sure if that's still the trend in India, but definitely in SEO now, it starts from getting influenced. And then you go down the funnel and start figuring out, you know, how you want to buy. 
a lot of the pure shopping queries though, shopping search is now we see moving to in the US to the Amazon app and here to the app of Lazada or Shopee and so on. Makes sense. So then follow up on the poll result just now, and we, we as we saw that on one side, the market, digital marketing is quite sophisticated. Uh, on the other side, uh, like, like half of the people actually built the user doing everything internal. Actually, do you suggest people to use external digital marketing consultant entry, or it's not so sophisticated entry, they can just like do every, uh, shall do, try to do everything in, in internal? I can go for that, which is, uh... Um, I think a bit of a conundrum answer. Um, the first part, and this is my personal belief disclaimer, digital work ma marketing is changing so fast. And what was not there, like think of Insta Reels, they have suddenly enveloped our lives, right? Now, if you ask me who's an expert on Insta Reels, the pro there is no one. You're, you're all going to learn it the first time around. So I think one very important thing, depending on the on the business that uh, that you are in as a, as a startup and entrepreneur, I think it's really important for you to have a good grip on the basics and have someone who's constantly learning and be clear that you're on a constant learning curve because what worked like three months ago, six months ago, one year ago may or may not be working. To supplement this internal expertise because a lot is happening and obviously your resources are getting consumed in doing multiple things having external support is actually useful because your external agency be it uh, be it the partners like like facebook themselves or an external agency who will step in on a specialized vertical they are like shining the light to you on things which are new and interesting without you having to reinvent and take bets all by yourself so i would say a balance but balance which is skewed towards uh, being quite hands on internally is 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 what i'm i'm most comfortable with yeah, I, I think I, I can second on that as well from my side. Um, what, what I feel, it's also a matter of what kind of talent you can hire, right? As we said before, everybody highlighted, you need to have a lot of analytical skill. And in the markets we are in, uh, in some markets, it's much harder to get that than in others. So, so sometimes it's great to have some externals helping you, training up your juniors. Um, because you just can't find the talent that you that you need in the beginning, but obviously long term, you, you you it's it's kind of a core business process to have everything under control. And this uh, sounds like uh, uh, digital marketing is one of the top choice for investment banking consulting VCs to move towards. Like Jenny was from IBE uh, VC background, you were doing IBE consulting before. And uh, some maybe it's uh, for the audience. Uh, anyone want uh, to get into this direction is a, uh, it will be a very well rewarded career. Yeah, and 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 this is actually one of the issues with finding the talent, right? Because typically the people who are highly skilled in numbers and analytics don't go to marketing agencies. They go to they go to investment banks. They go to consulting firms, but it's that skill that you need um, that you need and. And, and it's very hard to train people that in their early career didn't do that kind of work, right? If you're not, and, and a lot of people, I mean, I, I, I personally don't believe it's maybe true that, that you're a numbers person or not, not. I think a lot of it is trained. But a lot of people, once they are reaching a certain age, they just accept, oh, I'm not a numbers people, person, right? And, and that's something I struggle with a lot with my teams. Well, at least I, what, what I can do next eh, for my VC career does not really play out. <laughs> so yeah, let's uh, take uh, some uh, Q&A from the audience. Uh, actually, the first one is a uh, question I don't quite understand. It's B2B artificial tech company, how to optim optimize low, low, high, low rate keywords for niche uh, market. Uh, anyone understand the question and want to give it a try? If not, then maybe the Deborah, maybe you can expand the question um, a bit. Then the next one is how, how should your content message uh, differ across different social media channels for B2B business, especially LinkedIn versus Facebook, Instagram? Should it be different at all? I mean, I can go for that. I think 100%, whether it's B2B, B2C, it really doesn't matter. Uh, but I think, say, 
the 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 mind space at which the consumer is entering and participating with that media is going to be very different so your core message is going to be the same what you want the consumer to or the person to take away is going to be the same but how you say it most certainly will need to change uh, across medium cool thanks if no other comments then we just move on so the next one is um, how does uh, COVID-19 impact the market currently from your experience? I think this year really a lot of things has happened. I mean, I can start. I feel there was several phases of COVID-19 and in many countries they were completely different. So Indonesia, I studied a lot in the beginning, it crashed also the online sales because people were just concentrating on essential goods because there was a proper lockdown and, and they actually only bought that and they didn't actually buy a lot online. And then once they were locked in at home, they started buying a lot. Then they started getting worried about uh, their income. Sales dropped again. Then it opened up again and sales normalized. Then it closed down again. So I've, I've seen everything, right? I, I think underlying trend is very positive in the markets I'm seeing. I, I think people got introduced to buy stuff first time online. Um, or are doing it more frequently. And it's kind of something once you do it a couple of times, you will do it again because it is more practical than carrying stuff home and queuing in a queue. And people still will also carry with themselves for a while now that they, they don't want to be in crowded situations, right? So, so I think the underlying trend is very, very positive for anybody who sells stuff online, right? Well, uh, I may not go ahead. I'll follow Okay, so I think I'm fully aligned with uh, with Dury on it, and I want to add add a perspective. Um, this big burst which has happened on uh, online or e-commerce, definitely engagement. I think the question is an op is open out there, saying how many people are going to stick, right? I think I would ask the question differently with a business lens on. It's like how am I going to make them stick? So they came and shopped with us in this ecosystem, which is almost a forced scenario. When that scenario changes, what can we do to build our brand content, our messaging, our promise and our products to make them continue to stick with us? And while we do that, I think a very interesting conversation that we are having uh, uh, across is like that the answer is nobody knows because this event has never occurred. So I'm actually looking at this as a fascinating opportunity for literally everyone out there uh, to keep your eyes and ears open and kind of crystal ball gaze, but at the same time shape the future. The good part is nobody knows the answer. How big you are really doesn't matter. If you have billions of dollars to spend, doesn't matter. You still don't know the answer. So I think this is a great opportunity for, for, for startups where you're working on your own specific set of products to keep your eyes and ears open. And while you do that, I'd like to leave you with a particular phrase, um, which I definitely discuss a, a, a lot with my team, is that very often we <laughs> be selling the product to a consumer or a shopper, but we may or may not as individuals be that consumer or shopper. So for example, I'm a 25 something year old selling a, a wearable device for senior citizens. Yeah. In that case, I don't, I am not the shopper. I'm just selling a product or a service for that shopper. So I think it's very important to distinguish where am I the consumer and where am I the voice of the consumer and don't mix those up and be very, very clear on the signals that you're reading on the voice of your consumer, because everything that has happened in the past may have actually changed. So all the history, all the legacy, all the data and information that exists in the past may be transforming itself. And if you're able to grab those insights and those opportunities with the lens of being the voice of the consumer, I think it, it could potentially open up some very, very interesting things because it's kind of a level playing field that nobody knows and we're all, each of us has to figure it out. Yeah, well, you know, just kind of, uh, we actually also we have this view that it's very difficult to kind of predict what will happen post the pandemic. Right. But we're seeing a lot of increased activity on Facebook and recently we've launched two detailed studies on the post pandemic pandemic future with the caveat that no one will know, but like here's an attempt, right? 
So we've seen five years of digital transformation happen in one. We did an extensive survey in Southeast Asia, and the two things, a lot of stats, but two things I want to leave you with is that 40% of people bought buy primarily online now. There were 50% more categories bought online. And then we asked everybody, what would you do post-pandemic? If the restrictions were lifted, what would you do? So 80% of the people said that the habits that they've developed now of shopping online in key categories will stay. So if somebody shopped on fair price for the first time, they're 45 years old and never did it before, uh, but they shopped on an app and bought groceries, they will continue to buy them post-pandemic. And that has interesting implications for two, many parties, but two main parties. The first is enablers, people who will enable seamless experiences online, payments, logistics, supply, uh, anybody that's got anything to do with tying all of these things together to keep people online, like Meghna said. And the second is on traditional companies. So during, uh, you know, Lazada has now a 30% increase month on month on traditional brands registering shops on their platform. So traditional brands will now truly have to, we keep using the term only channel, but it's here now. So they will have to really think about how the channel mix has changed. And all of this uh, ties beautifully together on in, in, in you know, the discovery of new products and services on the internet. These changes will be quite permanent and what these changes will look like, no one knows, but everybody needs to watch out and be prepared for it. I guess, um, yeah, COVID certainly make uh, this year the tipping point um, for, for many things. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, uh, just, um, Take a step back um, for for Trio. You have been in the, in the in the industry for many years. If you look at look back, what what has been been the major change over the last uh, five to ten years in the digital marketing landscape for for in Southeast Asia and India? I can go first because I have a one word answer. It's automation and uh, machine learning. So that make our life easier. Yeah. So make make the career more. Uh, more interesting or less interesting? Now they have less to do, right? But there are human interventions on the creative side and building a business and building the product. So it's, it's, it's just the optimization that's getting automated, but everything else before that uh, requires even more imagination from human beings. That's my personal opinion. If I jump in, I think jumping exactly the opposite of what you're saying, where I think it's a art and a science, what I said earlier, and that is becoming even more nuanced. As the science kicks in, everyone has access to the science. End of the day, if Dury, Dhruv and me look at the same data on the same data set, or so rather we have the same access to the same data, but how we interpret that data is the art that we bring in, which is right. not just about the digital ecosystem, but about the consumer, about your product and put all of that together. So I think the role of the human is getting far more enhanced and that's where the power is going to, going to lie. So it's an art and a science. Well, I was uh, just accepted, getting accepted about that career choice, but you just de destroyed my interest. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? I mean, yeah, I, I see it similarly, right? I, I, I think, yes, there's a lot more automation and that kind of makes it a more play, level playing field. But then to get an advantage again, you just need to be a lot smarter, right? So back in the days, if you could do a bit of A-B testing and a bit of math, you were probably a lot better than anybody else. Now the basic stuff is done by the machine. So, so now you need to have a lot better ideas. And it's kind of a combination of understanding the data, but also being like imaginative what you could try out. Yeah. Be, be, be careful about the words you choose. Like not just be smart, also be creative, because that's us that, uh, and, uh, as Magna said. <laughs> Yeah, so actually the last question is like, um, what are the, some of the more exciting um, digital marketing thing that the thing that in the coming years, besides that uh, Drew for a share that uh, the, the traffic, the, the amount of uh, traffic coming online will be big, right? People are going to stay around. But what about uh, some of the new channels like TikTok or like WhatsApp is also getting um, leveraged uh, to, to for for con for consumers to use. What what do you what get you excited for the some of the new topics? I'm in India, right? So we're not talking about TikTok. 
Um, <laughs> so we no, now have I'm other one. But I think the one which I'm very fascinated by, while it's been around for a while now, uh, but I still think is quite raw and um, uh, lots to explore, is the entire space of AR and VR. I think our devices are getting uh, much brighter and smarter. And how do we bring that sweet spot of technology where, which can work on lo you know, lower uh, bandwidth and speeds and be able to come alive in a fascinating way? I don't think enough has happened there. So I'm really looking forward in a very excited way on how that can, that can come alive. And something like e-commerce and online shopping, and you know, like you said, omni-channel is becoming true, omni-channel, Dhruv. For all of that to explode, I think it requires a great backbone on this uh, AR and VR and an experiential dimension. So yeah, looking forward to uh, work in that space. Yeah, so what about uh, Dury and uh, Dhruv? Uh, yeah, maybe Dhruv, you wanna go first? I mean, well, I am. I continue to be excited about uh, social commerce. So, bringing the experience of uh, social buying and selling into uh, into onto the internet, right? So, you know, shopping for me is also a social experience. I go to the mall with my friends. I do many things with them there. How does that replicate online? We're seeing a lot of stuff in a very personalized way on WhatsApp. Uh, on, on messenger in many markets and uh, it's, it's con i think that will keep evolving and that will also play into the ar and vr world right because you will be using oculus and devices like that interacting with friends and shopping at the same time yeah that, I, I, oh sorry go go ahead go ahead yeah i see that very similarly right so so i mean one of the, all the rage with e-commerce is now like live streaming right but basically that goes more or less back to shopping TV, which I grew up with, right? <laughs> so, but basically because a lot of them are missing the interactive component, right? I mean, in shopping TV, you could also call in, but, but it was a bit different, right? So, so I think what, what, what will be really interesting is, okay, shopping is clearly becoming more interactive because between the, the buyer and the seller. But, but I think there we are really at the beginning. And if you look at, yeah, most live streams are just shopping TV. But, but I'm really looking forward to figuring out more interactive ways to do that. Yeah. Actually, the, what we see on the market on the live streaming part is that uh, uh, it's exactly like I said, it's um, uh, shopping TV plus uh, inter uh, like uh, real time interaction, but uh, largely it opens up uh, the uh, opportunity to creative. Many creators now can do marketing, sales, uh, and e-commerce at the same time. So that, that's, that's um, one of the largest um, opportunity and, uh, from, from China, from the WC community, seeing all this. Um, OK, th thanks a lot uh, for our great panelists uh, today for the sharing, for the very insightful sharing uh, about digital marketing. I hope uh, the audience um, uh, learned, uh, have enjoyed uh, the conversation as much as I do. Um, thanks again for, for everyone. So um, we are going to end the session today. So before, uh, before that, I uh, just want to advertise for our uh, next event, which is uh, session 10 on October 30th, uh, 4 p.m. Make sure to register. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dury, thank you, Drew, uh, thank you, Magna. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.